at a pace that is clear at the audience for the audience there? Yes, you are. Yeah. Okay, terrific. So first of all, thank you, Becky, for inviting me to speak at this conference. Uh, I want to extend my apologies that I can't be there in person due to uh, commitments in India. But I have to say, I think it's pretty fitting that I should give a talk on the digital revolution for global mental health live streaming on the internet. Um, I just hope that I, I don't live to regret those words. Um, so I'd like to really, first of all, uh, say that mm -hmm. I'm so thrilled that there's this amazing uh, agenda that Becky has put together and congratulations to her uh, for doing so. I wanted to really start by recognizing that um, um, the field of global mental health, when we started working in this area more than two and a half decades ago, I still have good memories that when I would talk to people in the community or policymakers about working in the area of mental health, there would be great skepticism, even cynicism, not least because many people denied that there was any such condition as mental health problems, particularly when you considered conditions like depression or substance use. These are just some of the various um, arguments that were put forward to people like myself uh, really indicating why there was no interest in mental health and why we should focus our energies on other health conditions. So, for example, many people would think that mental health problems were just an extension of the misery of everyday life. Some would consider this a medicalization of social suffering and would feel uncomfortable about applying a biomedical model. On the other hand, others would think that this was only a problem of the wealthy or the worried well is one particular term that I used to hear. Global health was largely concerned with diseases that kill, I was told, and mental health problems weren't real, really killer conditions. And finally, there was the concern that even if mental health problems were real health problems, they couldn't really be managed in low resource settings. Over the last two and a half to three decades, Researchers, innovators, practitioners have around the world been generating evidence to address each of these different assumptions and myths. On this slide, I am illustrating the important milestones on the road to mental health and sustainable development. And of course, some of you may wonder what I mean by sustainable development, and I will come to that in a moment. As you can see, these milestones go all the way back to 1990, and I could probably even go further back in time, but I think 1990 is a good starting point. In Caracas, in South America, of many South American countries assembled under the auspices of BAHO, produced at the Declaration on Mental Health and Human Rights, one of the earliest moments, I think, when the right to mental health care and the right to mental health itself was enshrined in a policy document. You can now see on this uh, uh, timeline a number of other key documents, each of which incrementally built on the previous ones, incorporating the new evidence that had emerged from the field of global mental health during the intervening years. The final one, which says to be published, is the Lancet Commission on Mental Health and Sustainable Development which hopefully will be published by the spring or summer of next year. Let me summarize then what this vast body of evidence has shown us about mental health problems in the global context. Firstly, and here I borrow on the Global Burden of Disease reports, the first of which was published in 1993 and reported on the burden of disease in 1990, and the most recent one, in fact, was published just last year. And what this slide shows is that irrespective of the state of development of a country, the burden of mental disorders, the proportionate burden as part of the overall burden of disease, has doubled in all countries of the world over the last 25 years. You can see the different countries of the world classified as high social uh, uh, sustainable Development Index, that's essentially uh, another way to describe the 
developed countries of the world, but also you will see similar trajectories for the low and middle income countries of the world. Now, some of you may be wondering why the high income countries have a higher proportion of the burden uh, than other countries. And that is simply because uh, other diseases, such as, for example, infectious diseases, uh, are much less common in those parts of the world. So therefore, the relative contribution of mental disorders is higher. The second kind of evidence has been around the relationship between mental health problems and social disadvantage. And on this slide, I show you the vicious cycle of poverty and mental disorder. We now know that people who live in conditions of social disadvantage, such as, for example, indebtedness, uh, extreme poverty, etc., are far more likely to experience a mental health condition due to a variety of different pathways, but also that those who live with a mental health condition are more likely to experience poverty, again, due to a variety of different pathways, setting into motion a vicious cycle. The third kind of evidence is on the relationship between mental health problems and other people who live with the person who's affected. In some ways, because we don't have a blood test or an x-ray to prove that a person has a mental health problem, Many people dismiss it as just a figment of one's imagination. And so it is a very powerful piece of evidence if you can demonstrate the impact of a mental health problem in a person on other people who they are intimately associated with. And one particular such relationship that has been examined has been the relationship between the mother and her newborn, particularly the relationship between depression in a mother the most common mental health problem that occurs in mothers and the growth of her newborn child, one of the most important global health priorities. In this particular paper, the evidence from 17 studies from 11 countries involving 14,000 mother infant dyads was brought together in a systematic review. The investigators asked the question, what was the increased risk, if any, that a child born to a mother who was depressed was likely to be undernourished or stunted. Astonishingly, the risk was 40 to 50% elevated for these two child nutritional outcomes in the babies of mothers who were depressed as compared to other babies whose mothers were in good mental health. The next kind of evidence was relating to the question of whether mental and substance use disorders were killer diseases. Now, on this chart, you will see two different bars. The smaller bar, which is the lower one, is the number of deaths that are directly attributable to mental and substance use disorders in the Global Burden of Disease report. As you can see, that's less than a million. But this is because very few people when they die, will have a cause of death report which attributes their death to a mental disorder. Typically, the cause of death will be something much more immediate, like a heart attack or an accident. The fact that the heart attack or the accident or indeed the suicide was because of a mental health problem is not actually counted. So if you looked at the excess deaths that occur in people with mental health problems, as we did recently, the number shoots up to nearly 14 million excess deaths occurring each year due to mental health problems. Clearly, mental health problems are, in fact, killer conditions as well. And the final piece of evidence was challenging the assumption that we couldn't address mental health problems in low resource settings where there were very few mental health professionals. Over the last decade and a half, there has been a flourishing evidence base that has demonstrated that non-specialized workers, such as community health workers and peers, and parents in the case of children, can deliver a range of psychological and social interventions for a range of different mental health conditions summarized here on this slide. What this body of evidence has done is that it has redefined our understanding of mental health care. For example, it has redefined what comprises a psychological intervention by acknowledging that many people with mental health problems have social difficulties and that any psychological intervention must also include a social work intervention. 
It has redefined where mental health care is delivered from thinking about just clinics and hospitals to reimagining the care delivery setting to primary health care, but perhaps most excitingly, directly to the person in their own homes. It has redefined the, prov the provider for mental health care from a mental health professional to not just non-specialist workers like community health workers, but peers and ultimately self-delivery. And how it is delivered? Often as a team. It isn't just the mental health professional working alone, but typically a team of people. And at the heart of that team is the person who is affected and his or her family members. It is this evidence that was summarized in the World Bank's disease control priorities recommendations that were published just last year. And perhaps most excitingly, and here is where I come to the sustainable development goals. Finally, after two and a half decades of advocacy and science, mental health has finally been acknowledged in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which are the backbone of development, not just for low and middle income countries, but indeed for the world as a whole, for all countries of the world. Within the SDGs, we now see mental health represented explicitly in two specific health goal targets, as you can see here in target 3.4 and 3.5, you will see specific reference to mental health and substance use targets. But importantly, target 3.8, which speaks about universal health coverage, is also an important target because universal health coverage includes coverage for both physical as well as mental health problems. So we have a lot to celebrate and a lot to be satisfied about that mental health acknowledged and included in the global development agenda. However, let us now take a reality check. Let us look at the distance we still need to cover. First, let us consider the treatment gap. And here, I'm referring to the treatment gap for people with established mental health problems, in particular, mood and anxiety disorders, which together comprise about three-fourths of the total burden of mental disorders globally. Even in the richest countries of the world, about 50% of people with these conditions have neither accessed or received any form of care in the previous 12 months. But if we consider the low and middle income countries, the treatment gap is even higher. How high? Well, with colleagues in China, we looked at the treatment gap for depression in the two most populous countries of the world, India and China, together accounting for about a third of the total population. Astonishingly, in these two countries, amongst the richest of the developing countries, 90% of people with a mood and anxiety disorder had received no care at all in the previous 12 months. But even when care is received, typically for people with severe mental disorders, the care is appalling in quality. We continue to see appalling conditions of care in mental hospitals. The most dominant healthcare facility for people with mental disorders in most developing countries, as illustrated in these terrifying images. But let us not think that such human rights violations occur only in the developing world. In the US, for example, in the majority of the states of that country, the richest country in the world, a country that spends three times more per capita on healthcare than the next most expensive country in the world, there are more people locked up in prisons than in psychiatric hospitals. That, of course, is simply another form of incarceration. Let us look at what all this evidence has done in terms of generating development assistance for mental health. On this slide, you can see the development assistance for mental health. And here, uh, the word development assistance really refers to the money rich countries of the world uh, make available through development assistance for the poorest countries in the world. And here you can see the amount of money that is given, dollars per DALI, which is a unit, a metric for the burden of disease. And you can see that about $140 
is given per DALI for HIV AIDS. And at the other end of the chart, you can't even see mental and substance use disorders appear. It is in fact less than a dollar per DALI for the burden of mental disorders. And thus, it is important for us to introspect here. In spite of all the knowledge and the evidence about the suffering and about the opportunities for low cost delivery models, we still have a long way to go to improve mental health in the global context. Friends, the element of the sustainable development goals is the idea of leaving no one behind. In the area of mental health, the implementation of evidence-based interventions in a community context for both the prevention and the treatment of mental health problems. This brings me then to the subject of the conference. The unprecedented opportunity that is offered by digital technologies to address some of these apparently insurmountable barriers to improving the health of our communities, the mental health of our communities in particular. This is a slide that you will have seen in many different forms. A slide that speaks to the dramatic exponential increase in the subscription of mobile phones in all countries of the world, from the poorest to the richest. And indeed, what's quite dramatic is even in fragile and conflict affected situations, the bubble bar uh, reflecting those countries, you will see a dramatic increase. We can expect this exponential line to continue to increase until we achieve near full coverage in the years ahead. Here's some factoids about mobile phone subscription. In India, where I'm currently based, more Indians own a mobile phone than have toilets in their homes. There is increasing access to the internet, and nearly half of the world's internet traffic comes not from the computer on your, on your desk, but in fact from mobile devices. In fact, in developing countries, it is the dominant form of accessing the internet. Still, let us also be conscious of the fact that this is by no means universal coverage. In South Asia, for example, just about a quarter of people currently have access to the internet through any device. What's been really most dramatic, I think, in terms of um, uh, the digital, the spread of digital technologies is, of course, social media. It is estimated that already over 2 billion people worldwide are connected with social media in all its various forms. And I'm pretty sure that many of you in the audience out there are already checking your accounts, even as you listen to me speak. How are these different digital technologies being utilized in mental health care? Earlier this year, we published a systematic review, a narrative review uh, in the Lancet Psychiatry that in our literature on the use of digital technologies in low and middle income countries. There was quite a large evidence base. 49 studies, although most of these studies were describing preliminary evaluations. Over 20 countries around regions of the world. Most of these different studies targeted, uh, described technologies targeting depression, but also a few targeted other kinds of mental health problems. And they use a range of digital technologies from telepsychiatry applications through to SMS, smartphones, as well as social media sites. On this slide, I will now summarize the five key focus areas that digital technologies have been deployed for use in the global context. The first is the use of web-based technologies for supporting clinical care and educating health workers. For example, through using online training and supervision for frontline workers to deliver mental health interventions. Secondly, the use of mobile tools, such as smartphone tools, for facilitating the diagnosis and detection of mental disorders. The most common example is the use of digital tools, such as questionnaires, in which the individual completes a questionnaire on a smartphone app, and that information is then analyzed to assess their mental health is technologies for promoting treatment adherence and supporting recovery. This, 
I think I think the best example I can think of in this particular domain is the use of SMS reminders for people to take their treatments or to come for appointments, and the use of social network sites to connect people already living with a mental health problem. The fourth is online self-help programs for individuals with mental disorders. Here are examples where the traditional face-to-face modality of delivering psychological treatments is now transferred to the internet and individuals guide themselves uh, through, the, the, through, through the therapy uh, online, sometimes with guidance. And finally, similar examples of online programs uh, in the area of substance abuse. A number of different um, uh, opportunities for digital technology. Firstly, to address workforce shortage, uh, for example, as I've already described, the training and supervision of community providers, but also using telepsychiatry to expand the reach of special specialist providers like psychiatrists uh, into rural and remote areas. Humanitarian crises, I've already showed you earlier that even in humanitarian context, mobile phone subscriptions remain high, and there are already very good examples of using, for example, social network sites as well as self-help tools to help people who have been displaced by conflict or disaster. Young people are a most obvious target group, not only because they are more likely to use technology, but also because most mental health problems have their origins before the age of 24. Young people don't traditionally like to use healthcare facilities, and therefore technology has a particular uh, attraction to reach this demographic. At the other end of the demographic spectrum, we have aging populations to support mental health care in late life, including dementia care. And finally, the use in clinical care, in treatment decision making, uh, and in particular, the use of big data. In the context of big data, I'm particularly excited about the use not just of social media globally, but also uh, large data sources that are being derived from healthcare providers so that the treatment experiences of patients can help inform the treatment decisions that future patients uh, who engage with the service might benefit from. However, we must also recognize the limitations of the evidence. First of all, there are, as I mentioned earlier, very few rigorous evaluations. And those which do evaluate rigorously show mixed results. For example, it is disappointing, I'm sure, for many of us to learn that self-help on its own is not terribly effective unless it is given with guidance, guidance from a remote counselor, for example immediately believe that technology in and of itself is a panacea for all the different barriers to improving mental health care. And we should constantly demand not just innovation, but also evidence. Of course, and I'm sure this is an issue that you will discuss at the conference, is the issue of privacy. Increasingly, as we know, everything we do on the internet can be tracked, packaged, and sold. And I think Therefore, we should also be conscious of the risks to which online sites, for example, can be utilized in a way to actually disclose individuals' own mental health problems. We need to be concerned about equity and access. I've already described to you that only about a quarter of South Asians, for example, have access to the internet. And of course, that quarter will tend to belong to a better off socioeconomic class. We need to be careful about equity and access, lest digital technologies actually widen health inequalities unless we specifically address access uh, to the marginalized, to the poor, to women, to rural areas, etc. And finally, we are applying very outdated ideas of evaluation to technology. Those outdated ideas that worked very well with clinical interventions are not really suited, in fact, for technology, because by the time the evidence is available, the technology itself is already outdated. It is these sorts of challenges that the very important recent publication by the NIH seeks to actually identify and consider the opportunities of developing information technologies for behavioral and social science research with a specific goal to improving the quality of mental health care and for the prevention of mental health interventions. 
I want to end by just sharing with you some examples of work that our, my program in India is engaged with, which demonstrates some of these opportunities to overcome some of the challenges in the use of digital technologies in mental health care. All the examples I'm about to share with you, and there are four to follow, are low cost and scalable. These are the principles that guide global mental health. They're low cost, they're scalable, they're practical for use by non-specialized workers in routine settings. They promote self-help and empowerment of the ultimate beneficiary, and they are always backed by evidence. The first example, and this is all work in progress, so I don't have any results. This is funded by the Wellcome Trust, is the PRIDE program for adolescent mental health in which a paperless system for learning, self-help for mental health problems, uh, both mood anxiety as well as behavioral problems in adolescents is being developed. There are two components to this platform. A counselor component, which you can see through the learning system, the electronic medical record system, and the peer supervision system, as well as a self-help system, which can towards their own recovery with or without guidance from the counselor. The second example is in a different demographic, very young children. The use of portable technologies, both based through gaming as well as portable EEG for assessing cognitive development. For those of you who work in the area of early child development, you will know that one of the biggest challenges to improving addressing child development in the developing world is the fact that the assessment requires proprietary tools that require a long amount of time for delivery and require highly trained professionals to deliver. Games, for example, to as it were get inside the brains of young children is a powerful opportunity for us to begin to assess cognitive development domains such as memory, attention, and executive functioning and to examine how this might actually provide a portable tool to assess brain development across the early life course. We extend this idea not just to normal de development, but also deviant development. For example, we're aware that children with autism have a particular deficit in social communication, a deficit that translates into a preference for gazing at inanimate objects such as for example on this screen you can see on a tablet two different kinds of images one of a child and one of a train we are using tablet-based technology to assess whether we can discriminate between children with autism by simply examining the preference to look at an inanimate object versus an animate object on a screen through eye tracking the final example is perhaps a, a more well-known one, which is the use of the internet to get young people to engage with mental health, to combat the stigma of mental health problems uh, by using the internet to share personal stories about their own mental health uh, uh, conditions, media, poetry, stories, film, and so on. To log into the site, although it's India specific right now, we certainly don't think it only applies to young people in India. And beyond, here are three examples of work that I am about to engage with, with partners in India and internationally. Mobile phone based active and passive monitoring of mental health. For example, by using passive monitoring of the use of the mobile phone as a proxy behavioral marker for mood. Artificial intelligence enabled chatbots. We are partnering with Touchkin, whose founders are attending the conference in London and will be running a workshop, in fact. Um, we are going to work with them to evaluate their automated chatbot online. And working with colleagues from different countries to develop a cloud-based machine learning system for guiding the personalized selection of different treatment options for people with depression. In conclusion, for me, Digital technologies, I believe, can genuinely transform the abilities for people to care for their own mental health and that of others across the world and offer a dramatic new opportunities to address some of the great barriers that we face ultimately with the goal of reducing the global burden of mental disorders. I'd like to just acknowledge John Nasland, uh, the lead author of the Lancet Psychiatry Review, for his collaboration in preparing this talk. Thank you very much. Uh, Becky, I'll stop there and I'm going to turn my slides off.
and then return to the video. Hi, can you see me? We're just uh, we're just transitioning now, so in a few moments, hopefully, that will be. There we go. We can see you now. Okay, great. Vikram, thank you so much. Um, on behalf of the audience, um, I'll just show show some of the audience here. Um, what I will do. Oh, I've lost the audience now, and I've lost you as well, Becky. Oh. <laughs> There you are. Okay. Um, but everyone's saying thank you. Hopefully you can see them. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Um, I know I have questions, but I want to open it up to the floor first. So what I'd like to do is invite um, members of the audience, if you'd like to come and sit in the chair um, and, and speak with Vikram, and then we'll open it back up. But I'll just switch so you can have more of a, a personal connection with Vikram. So um, please, by all means, just uh, feel free to wander up. And if not, I can... I will I will kick things off Vikram. <laughs> okay, Vikram. So here we here we go. Hi Vikram. Oh, so, that's cool. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Um so I am an optimist, um, but my question is pessimistic. So um, I'm just a bit concerned. I've been around when the genome was discovered and everyone was excited and um, I was around when the, the brain imaging came out and everyone was excited. So we've searched through heaps of genes, heaps of, of voxels um, and I'm, I'm worried that we're searching through <coughs> some social space and the effect sizes will be small. Um, the placebo effect will be large and the number of different methods will be um, highly redundant and and possibly um, very confusing for individuals to know even with guidance what treatment works for them and and how can they be in control of that process the whole time when we look at the the social digital space so again I am an optimist um, but I thought um, I would just throw these um, sort of caveats or, or very important issues um, towards you um, statistically socially uh, there's a lot of a lot of things here so um, how where do we even begin and how do we all work together so that we're not doing redundant um, things and that we're not just producing sporadic um, new frontiers of digital mental health that's a really good question Paul I will say that um, the example you gave is the revolution, but I will also give another example, which is the neuroscience revolution. We've seen billions of dollars being spent on understanding the human brain. Um, and if you listen to Tom Insel, who was a director of the NIMH, he, he's even a bigger pessimist than you are. Um, uh, you know, he, he, he says that there's almost nothing that's tangible that's come out of uh, two or three decades of heavy investment uh, in neuroscience. I will say one thing about uh, genomics, though. It is true that we haven't seen something dramatic, but there are instances and a growing number of instances in which um, the understanding of the human genome is beginning to transform healthcare. And I think the best example is to do with cancer care. I'm not going to go into any detail on this, but I just wanted to flag up that it's not completely without uh, some some impact. And I think so, I think what's important is to re remember the latency that the idea that you could have an impact immediately is something we should not be uh, relying on, but instead look at this as an incremental growth in knowledge rather than exponential one. The difference with digital technologies and genomics is that it's more democratic. The genomic and the brain revolutions were highly specialized. They were in the domains of only a few scientists with very high levels of expertise and also a lot of money. But digital technologies are completely democratic and they are being utilized by people around the world, both rich and poor countries. They tend to be low cost, they tend to be user driven. Uh, this is quite different in my mind from uh, a neuroscience and genomics. The risk though, is that therefore the same kinds of standards of evidence may not be applied. You know, there are so many hundreds of apps out there for depression today. And yet when we looked, uh, there was, uh, it was in our group, a systematic review that examined the evidence on whether these apps actually help people. There's almost nothing out there. So I think that is the danger, the danger that things are being put out on the internet, but we really don't know which ones we should recommend because really they all, none of them have been properly evaluated. So if there's one message I would give 
to the community in the audience there is that a partnership between innovators in the technology area with people who are interested in evaluating technology, I think is the most important way to ensure that actually technology delivers goods and doesn't just become, as it were, uh, more hype um, that uh, I think you, you are alluding to, that is more hype than fantasy. The other thing I will just say one more thing is that sometimes, you know, you can have small effect sizes, but if an intervention is extremely low cost and is easily accessible at a population level, actually a small effect size can translate into very large benefits for the population. Uh, many of you will have heard of the name Jeffrey Rose. He was a professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and he spoke about the importance of population level interventions that were of small effect, affecting the whole of the population. And the best example he gave was of salt. So the idea, he said, is if everyone in the population uses a bit less salt, we will dramatically reduce uh, uh, the prevalence of heart disease. So in some respects, if you can even produce small improvements in people's mental health by using digital apps for, for example, building resilience, uh, improving mindfulness, et cetera, just to give two examples of apps out there, well, that might overall improve population mental health in the long run. Thank you, Vikram. Thank you for spinning that around as well. I really appreciate that. Um, okay, so I'm just going to go back to the audience. Um, if anyone would like a question. Hi, Vikram. So I'm, I'm Rashid Zaman. I'm a psychiatrist and a, uh, and a researcher from Cambridge. So uh, first of all, I want to thank you for that wonderful talk. But I do have one question that kind of, um, I mean, I'm also belonging to this um, tele-mental health uh, section of the European Psychiatric Association. So I've got, I've got interested in tele-mental health. Um, great to see that your work. But one of the worries that I have at a meeting was brought up by Medical Defense Union um, representative. They said that if you're going to deliver mental health treatment to individuals in another country, then you're not covered. And those are the kind of things that worried me. And I was just wondering, how did you deal with these practical problems? Maybe you didn't work with individual yeah. people. Well, that's a really, you know, I have to say that's a, that's one I haven't heard of before, but that's an interesting question. So I can't say I'm prepared for that answer. Most of uh, all my uh, work is with local populations. And of course, working in India, you know, the whole idea of medical in uh, indemnity is a nascent concept compared to Britain. Um, so I can't say that in the developing world, these are, these are even, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a huge gap uh, in terms of indemnity and, 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 um, insurance and so on and what happens in the real world uh, I, I I think this is this is a good example of where current regulations that are related to healthcare whether it's to do with for example evidence generation if I had to go for example to a medical journal and say I wanted to evaluate a publish a paper on technology they would apply the same rules that would apply to say a face-to-face -face psychological treatment or a drug treatment and as I mentioned earlier I think those paradigms need to actually be rethought because technology is almost evolving on a day-by-day -day basis unlike say for example a drug which is a static product which yeah. will not change at all and so i think we have to reimagine even the paradigms for evaluation and similarly the paradigms for regulation consider an app you talk about telepsychiatry which is one kind of intervention but even an app is an intervention so for example if you worked in a health facility and, and NICE, for example, now recommends self-help, including apps uh, for certain conditions. What is your liability if, for example, so you recommend an app to someone and that they should, for example, attempt suicide? You know, are you, are you likely to be held up for not having provided them a more intensive intervention? So I think these are gray areas. I don't know whether there's an answer already out there, but it certainly suggests to me that, you know, this conference should certainly begin to grapple with medical legal issues uh, as well uh, around um, the utilization of digital technologies for mental health. The other one is, of course, privacy, which I've already mentioned. I don't know how secure much of this digital uh, technology is in terms of protecting the identity of the uh, of the user. I mean, given how easy it is for people to hack in to even the most secure uh, uh, websites, one must be a little worried about these online apps that get you to enter your names, you know, your address, your telephone numbers, etc., and then also get you to, uh, to, to to enter information that is very personal uh, about your mental health. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Hi, Vikram. 
Um, I'd just like to add um, on the note of safety, actually, one of our delegates, obviously I won't point out who this person is, and they introduced me to a new type of culture, which is safety culture. And that's the first time I've ever really considered it as a culture. And I think that it is important that we, we start to recognize safety as a culture. Uh, so that might be a topic that we cover here at the conference. Um, so any other questions? Yeah. Hello, Vikram. Thank you very much for your talk. It was fascinating. Uh, my name is Victoria. Um, I run um, a digital innovation organisation, um, which is part of the NHS in the UK. Um, and I'm going to keep the um, slightly pessimistic, sceptical theme that Becky uh, initiated. <laughs> um, and that is, um, you gave us a very optimistic vision for digital mental health. I wonder if you could imagine a more dystopian future and how we might um, be prepared for that and how we might um, uh, plan for it and, and plan to manage it. So I'm thinking about the potential to increase inequality, um, uh, the, the, the concerns about surveillance, about social control, um, and you've already touched on excuse me, data um, and privacy being compromised. So I just wonder whether you could talk to us a bit about how you think we should be anticipating some of the more dystopian uh, potential futures and how we might manage them, anticipate and respond well, you to know what? I, Yeah, I think that's a really important question. And I, you know, I, I, yeah, I was being optimistic. It's the start of a conference and it would be terrible if I, <laughs> I'm very optimistic. Sort of, you know, in, in inflicted on you all the negatives. I, I think Becky would have been very upset with me. Um, but you're, of course, <laughs> right to uh, you know point out these concerns they're not necessarily concerns to do with mental health interventions but more generally the increasingly pervasive use of digital technologies in every aspect of our lives um, and so surveillance is not about mental health care alone it's about the fact that everything you and I are doing right now uh, is already being mapped it's already being um, uh, you know and that information is not only being mapped but in fact, it's becoming a product that is being used uh, for commercial purposes. So I think, um, you know, I think that, it, and it's not being done without permission. Um, you know, we haven't really allowed people to use that information. Another dystopian example, uh, and I, this is all stuff that I've been reading. There are clinics now opening, for example, in India on internet addiction, uh, where young people are actually so completely consumed by being online that they are now uh, ignoring uh, very important other aspects of their lives, including social uh, interactions. So not, you know, so they're preferring to spend more time actually on virtual social interactions, like rather than the more traditional face-to-face -face interaction. And you know, you could question whether, in fact, a virtual interaction has the same quality of uh, and the depth as a face-to-face -face interaction has. So there are clinics that have opened now in India that are treating internet addiction like another addiction, like a substance use. Um, similarly, you know, I'm sure all of us are familiar about the internet being used as a new medium for bullying. Uh, and this is especially true for very young adolescents. Uh, you know, bullying, uh, it can be very vicious, very nasty. You can see uh, young people being groomed for a variety of different um, fairly risky behaviors, sexual risk behaviors, also radicalization, etc. So. Yes. As a society, I think we need to step back and think about how the internet can be used as well as misused. But within the mental health space, I think that's a very specific opportunity for us to actually use our knowledge of mental health uh, to embed those protective mechanisms, I think, within, uh, like, for example, Facebook, um, uh, you know, uh, Instagram, etc. Um, I think you know that Facebook now has a suicide, um, it has a specific algorithm that, uh, you know, tries to pick up when certain chats might sort of uh, uh, give people concern that the person who's uh, may, may have suicidal ideas, etc. This might be one example of how one can create a more humane uh, internet um, uh, community. But I, I don't think there's a straightforward answer to the dystopian risks that the digital revolution has. Thank you. And I think I think it um, calls for a multidisciplinary approach, bringing in the humanities and the arts, as well as psychiatry and, and mental health services. So, thank you. We actually have a talk on Facebook. This is intervention by Jennifer. 
Hello, Professor Vikram. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, my name is Mariana Pinto da Costa. I'm a psychiatrist from Portugal, and I'm now doing a PhD in London. And I wanted to ask you uh, if you think that we are already in a time that we can rely in technology and the digital revolution for um, the development and the events of relationships in the world keeping in mind that uh, low and middle income countries though they don't have stable electricity and they are so linked one to each other because you can have like an ipad or a phone or whatever but there aren't stable resources when you can charge these devices and my second question was um how can we as mental health professionals have a role in terms of changing this and if we should uh, use technology already or not uh, also to advocate um, that low and middle income countries have better access to potable water and of course uh, mental health care. So Mariana, I'm not sure I understood your question. Could you just say the first part again? Uh, just just um, clarify what the concern yeah. was. So the whole point uh, is uh, that technology uh, needs electricity, right? So okay. we are like speaking with you over Skype and we have the computer now charged because we are relying in electricity and UK has quite a stable uh, resource of electricity. But my point is that um, in many countries in the world, such as in low and middle income countries, there aren't stable resources mm -hmm. of electricity okay. and there's always this need of rely on generators, blah, blah, blah. So is where exactly should we put our focus? Should we already expect that technology will resolve and um, all these issues? Or should we address the basics that is so much lacking um, in so many places? Yeah, OK, I understand. Yeah, OK, so I did understand your question. Um, I, I, yeah, so I don't think technology is going to resolve the lack of in electricity access, for sure. But what it is going to do is going to make the demand for electricity much more vocal. If, for example, communities are now recognizing that they can do business much more easily in rural and remote areas if they were connected to the internet. For example, in many parts of the world, farmers are able now to negotiate directly with buyers prices that are actually more attractive for them as opposed to going through middlemen. Um, because they can now directly buy and sell produce and fertilizers, etc., on the internet. This means that farmers are now demanding access to the internet. This means that the elected officials uh, are now having to actually deliver electricity. It's no longer just a light bulb or a fan in the house, but actually access to livelihoods, which is transforming the access to electricity, which is the necessary infrastructure. I was reading something really interesting recently that described mobile phone, phone towers with 3 and 4G connectivity in some of the rural areas of India where there was no electricity. And it's interesting, I, 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 the, the journalist was reporting how uh, they were coming up with new devices for charging mobile phones that were solar electricity based. So the, the mobile phone companies were essentially placing solar panels to run the towers because there was no electricity. And the same solar panel technology was being used domestically to actually charge mobile phones. So you basically had a, had a socket in the house, a mobile phone panel on the roof, and at night, you just stuck your, your phone into that socket. Now, that's ingenuity. And in some ways, um, you know, people, when they recognize that a very low cost option like accessing the internet, which is actually free for many of these uh, uh, users, can actually improve your livelihoods, they will find ingenious ways to get electricity and they will demand electricity from their government. So do you think we have a role in addressing uh, these gaps that is, exist in terms of what is basic across well, the populations? More broadly, yeah, more broadly healthcare pr providers do. So for example, many rural areas in the country are getting telemedicine set up because doctors will not go work in those areas. Uh, and so the government recognizing that, you know, it's impossible to fill vacancies in rural and remote areas have now decided that by investing in technology, they don't actually need to get the doctor into the rural areas. They can have the doctor sitting in the city and actually connecting uh, with, the, with the rural areas, with nurses and, and patients directly. So yes, more broadly with healthcare, yes, you know, mental health care is the orphan child of healthcare. Uh, I think we have to piggyback, as it were, on, 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 on other areas of healthcare to make sure that that technology is put in place rather than only thinking of mental health care in that context. 
-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think we have time for one final question. Yes. Hi, Vikram. I am Ruslan Savivsky. I'm a psychiatrist from Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, and I, I just uh, thank you for, for your lecture and uh, just a short comment. Uh, to start with, uh, for the uh, Portuguese uh, psychiatrist, you do not need uh, internet for digital psychiatry. You, you, can, you can have the whole full future uh, therapy in USB stick. So, and you can, of course, run this USB, USB stick with one hour solar energy to start with. Mm -hmm. uh, then about all, all those dangerous things which can come from digital psychiatry, of course, uh, it is like any psychiatry, it is dangerous. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you, you, you can always misuse everything, of course. And, I, I I did digital psychiatry last 20 years, so I kind of been there for a while. And uh, I, I would like just to comment to say that one of the first things I, I do in my digital uh, group therapy, I teach my patients uh, how to recognize a psychopath, uh, not to be used by psychopath, because psychopaths are there, and of course they will use you if you they know you know all your weak weakness and. Uh, softness and uh, sensitivity and uh, it, it is an issue so uh, one of the first thing i do in this uh, therapy i teach people how to recognize bad people because many of those bad people are kind of very charming and uh, yeah this is a part of it and we did this group therapy now for i would say 18 years and uh, I, i believe we have one psychopath who who try try to you know to uh, destroy the group, but um, we kind of discover in time. So just short and uh, thanks again. Uh, of course, I, I'm very optimistic. Digital psychiatry is the future, and uh, it's not that complicated. It is working, but uh, I will uh, I will agree with all those who say that it's sorry to say too to to few evidence right now but it will come thank you thank you very much uh, thank you Becky. thank you Vikram. thank you to all of you for the questions uh, uh, all a very beautiful conference and uh, a wonderful few days and and any any final notes you'd like to leave us with Vikram over the yeah, no, I'm, I'm just very sorry that I can't be there the program looks absolutely fantastic uh, and uh, I'm, I'm really really sorry that I can't be there with you okay well thank you very much on behalf of myself and the audience so.